Welcome to our final installment of this Humaculture Perspective series on optimal behavior. Today, we will share some ways we worked with a real client using the Humaculture framework to help transform an organization's culture through the behavioral change techniques we've discussed in this series. Colin and Hanley will explain how their four powers model was at play in the way we address this client's needs. We'll forego the introductions today. If this is your first time seeing one of our webinars, we invite you to watch replays of our previous webinars. In each of those, we introduce ourselves in various ways that will help you get to know us a little better. We have a lot to cover today, so let's dive right in. If you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A rather than the chat so we are better able to see them. Sounds good, Steve. So let's, uh, let's uh, Steve said set, set, said, set the stage by sharing a little bit about our case study organization. And yes, again, this uh, case study that we chose is based on a real human culture client, but the quote names have been changed to protect the innocent. Uh, so let's introduce you to the customer through the human culture lens. Well, first of all, their environment, uh, was uh, one of a, it's a regional retailer that operated in the same area as several national retailers. There's intense price competition and that keeps operating margins razor thin. Their capital investment consists mainly of real estate, uh, their stores and inventory. The organization itself is employee owned through an employee stock ownership plan or ESOP. Um, as far as its endowment of real assets, uh, really the Past leadership had done a pretty poor job of just booking the depreciation expenses and never making commensurate capital reinvestment in the stores, and that retained more cash for things like executive bonuses. Uh, the, as far as intangible assets are concerned, uh, the brand had been increasingly viewed as kind of tired and dingy. Many of the stores were worn and outdated, and uh, the employees who really should feel like co-owners and teammates really were pretty much at odds with each other. Um, from the people perspective, um, employees were viewed by leadership primarily as, as expenses or uh, payroll merely a, a line item expense to be managed. I think customers were taken mostly for granted and leadership didn't seem to really appreciate or understand the experience that most customers were seeking or what would be valuable to them. As far as rewards were concerned, they had the typical cash compensation, payroll, that sort of thing, uh, and also typical employee benefits. Uh, employees were also awarded uh, ESOP shares after a certain period of service, but because the company was performing so poorly, uh, the value of those ESOP, ESOP shares wasn't increasing very much, and it certainly wasn't much appreciated by the employees. When it comes to the thought of creative mm -hmm. value for this organization, they typically only thought of creative value in terms of gross margin. Uh, they didn't really understand that things like the customer experience is a creative value that will contribute to the gross margin over time. So we needed to help make decisions about the allocation of real assets. But our greatest challenge was helping this organization find ways to help employees change from behaving as though they just have jobs to acting as the owners that they really are. That was the single most important outcome. But there were other behaviors that needed to change as well if this organization was going to thrive in the future. Even if more cash were available to invest in pay and the business, it would not help without the needed fundamental mind shifts and behavior changes. So today we're going to be talking with Colin Hanley of Virtuosity Team, using our case study organization as the example and uh, really exploring how the Virtuosity Team change framework applied in this, this circumstance uh, as we helped the organization develop confident and capable people, uh, an inspired workforce, an agile workforce, and people who are armored against distractions. The organization was stuck behind a series of self-imposed barriers and lack the agility and wisdom to move from its current state. And even where change might have been attempted, the people were generally dragged back into the old ways of doing things by a persistent and unhelpful culture. Uh, Steve, whereas it seems to me that they got themselves completely stuck and they didn't know how to create the change to, to move forward because they got a culture that thrived on doing nothing, frankly. 
Mm-hmm. They've created a situation for themselves that any change requiring any resource could be shot down simply because the resources weren't there to make it happen. Where an organization is stuck like this, the Four Powers Framework that we've covered in the webinar series is a powerful tool for unlocking energy for change. So, Steve, do you want to start us off by looking at the challenge, specific challenges faced by the retailers so that we can link them back to our change framework? Sure, Colin. The first problem that we needed to address was extremely high staff turnover, which was 110% overall and 242% for the store clerks. That's the equivalent of the entire business turning over every year and the clerks turning over two and a half times each year. While turnover in retail is generally high at well over 100%, this was extraordinary, especially when you think about how employee ownership should lead to stickiness. The underlying reason, the business was not increasing pay based on performance, but rather simply based on time and position. Those that had been there longest received the highest pay. No matter how newer colleagues performed, they could not catch up to their longer serving colleagues. We don't need to tell you how demotivating that was, particularly for the high performing staff they needed to be successful. Yeah, so looking at this through the lens of the change framework, there are actually two linked problems with the way in which the business was working. Firstly, turnover was too high, that's obvious, but the behavior that was creating this was a longevity-based pay scale. This is a demotivating business behavior in the systems context. There was nothing linking pay to performance, so there was no incentive to perform. Quite the opposite, in fact. Yeah, that's exactly right. But then the second part of the problem is that that the impact this had on the the employees was that the higher performing uh, employees were actually being ostracized by the few longer service employees because the better performing employees were making them look bad. So not only was there no incentive to perform, but there was also active resistance, which flared up every time somebody attempted to exceed expectations. Yeah, and that's an issue in the social context where there seems to be active resistance, right? Mm -hmm. This would have stopped the self-development of colleagues who would feel that such personal growth was worthless and may even undermine their position amongst their colleagues. So there's no incentive to grow capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's right. And the third problem they faced was poor customer experience in the, in the stores, create, causing sales to drop off. Although the poor state of the buildings was a partial cause of this, the main reason was a lack of training of the workers on the shop floor. Employees were not trained to focus on or care for the customers in the shop or to create the desirable or pleasant experience for them. They had other concerns associated with keeping shelves and rails stocked with a full range of goods. When customers entered the store, they weren't welcomed. When customers had problems or couldn't find something, the store staff would help, but only reluctantly. My interpretation of this is that it's a problem of growing capability in the self context. Staff either felt incompetent to assist or they lacked the confidence to do the right thing because of the way the culture of the Mm -hmm. shop was set up. But you mentioned they also had a problem with the state of the stores. Should we pick that up next? Yeah, absolutely, Colin. So, yeah, the state of the stores was, in fact, a big problem. So for several years again, uh, and it may have been due to many factors, cap the capital structure of the business, certain debt requirements, debt service requirements, et cetera, the, des- the desire we mentioned to pay bonuses over capital reinvestment. But there had been very little reinvestment of funds back into the asset infrastructure. So, most of the stores were run down and shabby. And the effective message was just that the company didn't care either for its employees or its customers. Yeah, so from what you said, anyways, it seems like there was little pride being taken in the building. Mm-hmm. So staff also took little or no pride in the way that the, in which they did their jobs, which given the nature of the ownership of the business might seem really surprising, but it illustrates the often underestimated power of the spaces context. Mm-hmm. The physical spaces in which staff and customers worked and interacted actually became barriers to the customer experience and sales. Any employees trying to change this would have felt some friction or resistance linked to the fact that the employer was clearly not investing to make the stores look or feel good. So I think we all agree that this organization needed change. When thinking about change, we reference the change ecosystem. It's a process of conscious culture creation designed to create the right influences for the desired change to be more natural for employees. 
the first question we have to ask here is, are the current cultural conditions such that one can expect change? To understand the culture, we assess the influences occurring in the four contexts we've covered in webinars so far. And within those contexts, the energy within the system that drives the capacity of the herd, that system is the four powers. When you address all powers, all four powers, and all the contexts, you will create a more dynamic and flexible culture. Of course, the ecosystem is a, is a cycle. So at the end of the initial round of changes, you should look back and reassess where the strengths and the weaknesses sit. You can test how effective you've been at achieving the desired outcome, and then refine and evaluate the changes, change influences in order to improve alignment for the next steps, whatever they may be, so that the cycle begins again. Okay, great. That's a, that's a great reminder of how the ecosystem works. So let's take a look at the specifics of what we did uh, within the organization and how those things fit into the Virtuosa Team Change framework. So our challenge was how to go about creating the change that the organization wanted and needed. We needed lower staff turnover, improved recognition of high performers, uh, we needed an enhanced customer experience, and we needed to really unlock the embedded value of the physical store assets. So we've already set each of the problems in a context, and of course, we've covered each of those contexts during the previous webinars, but uh, maybe we should refresh our memories of what each context represents by having each of us speak to the context in which we operate most effectively according to the change superpower assessments we did. No, that's a great idea, Wes. Influence occurs in the four contexts in which we live our lives, but if you remember the goldfish bowl from our previous webinars, we are usually blissfully unaware of those influences. Because they are so powerful and yet hidden from view, they can often be overlooked in the change process, meaning that the new behavior either fails to take hold or fails to last. So we know the four contexts, and Colin, uh, the first context is systems, uh, where it's, which is where your superpower is the strongest. So maybe you could kick us off. That's right. So the, the systems context represents the influence that's exerted by policies and procedures, rules, regulations, legislation, and even the, the, the culture of the business. It, it, think of it as the virtual space that surrounds us. And it kind of acts like tram lines for behavior that we, we need to stay within. The second one is mine. That's the spaces context. And that's most often represented by physical environments. So the stores and head office in this client's context, but also the physical materials people use and see, like computers and signs on the walls. I often refer to this context as signs and signals because um, it covers a lot more than just the physical buildings. Yeah, the third context on the graphic is where I operate well. The social context <laughs> represents the influence that people around us exert. In this case study, it's the colleagues on the shop floor or in the head office, that the bosses and subordinates in the work context, but also family and friends outside the workplace who all have an opinion and love to share it with us. And finally, there's the self context or context of self, which is where most training takes place. It deals with the individual, what they know and who they are. The problem often is that we understand messages that we receive through a series of personal lenses and filters, and that often um, may alter the intended meaning or our interpretation of those messages. Right. So I think we should always also remind listeners of the formula for change. So the formula refers to the energy or powers that need to change within each context. If a change is to be made, we need to think about the forces that act on people and make appropriate adjustments to create a new balance. So let's run through each of the four powers with each presenter, again, taking their personal superpower according to the change superpower assessment. By the way, we'll post a link uh, to this assessment in the chat so that if you want to do the assessment yourself or, and, and or you missed the opportunity uh, in earlier webinars, you can certainly do that after the webinar is finished. So the four powers, let's start with grow capability, which if I recall correctly, uh, is yours, Wes. Yeah, that's right, Hanley. And uh, I think this this virtuosity team formula for change really helps uh, me to see the, the importance of growing capability. And that's to help people have both competence and confidence to make change. If change is going to happen, 
not only do people have to know how to do the new behavior, but they've got to be confident they can do it and not look foolish. It's, the power to inspire motivation involves finding ways to create lasting energy focused on that desired change. Energy can be extrinsic, meaning created by external forces acting on you, or intrinsic, which means driven from within you. Mm -hmm. The next is overcome barriers, which is my superpower. This involves knowing that barriers to change exist and will emerge. They can be physical, but more usually they are mental or emotional. Overcome barriers is about having the energy to navigate around them or through them when they occur. And then the final power is the power to resist temptations, which is literally about being able to resist the temptation to revert back to old ways of behaving. So the formula states that if you increase the powers to grow capability and inspire motivation, which are in green on the left hand side there, while reducing barriers and temptations, which is in blue on the right hand side, then the result of this formula, which you could think of as an organizational change ability, increases. Yeah, and this is really great. And, and I know this formula has been well received and deployed in many organizations in real life. So let's let's go back now to the case study organization we're looking at. Look at what we did in practice, and then we'll view that through the lens of the four powers change framework. So the first problem was staff turnover, particularly of the high performers. We proposed that jobs, pay, and benefits focus on ownership, skills, performance, and that longevity only play a minor role. There were several changes, but I will focus on three examples of how we realigned rewards. As a first example, we recommended that jobs become skills-based uh, to be considered for a position with more pay. Uh, second, we increased the sense of ownership by emphasizing the ESOP value, moving to earn time through PTO, and a shift from pension to 401k. Thirdly, we shifted focus from future value to current value. To do this, we reduced payout of vacation upon termination to earlier accruals and shifted focus of retirement and security benefits to support of financial well being. So let's look at uh, where these interventions sit in the four powers framework. So one of them. Uh, involves restructuring a system, in this case, a reward system, mm -hmm. to focus on performance, development, and other de desirable behaviors. Uh, you've created an initial change in the system's context to increase the power to grow capability, which is one of the challenges the company was experiencing. Another change uh, was that you redesigned benefits to be linked to desirable behaviors, mm -hmm. um, and that influence method is called offer meaningful rewards which also exists in the systems context, but this time in inspire motivation. So you've redesigned the system context to support the desired change and the influence of uh, the influence powers of growing capability and inspiring motivation were also addressed. What else did you do? Well, one, one thing we did was to redesign the job specs, the specifications. So there was an explicit requirement for employees to focus on developing other team members. So it created a more team-focused mindset. So in practice, what this meant was is that for each job description, we included specific responsibilities to train and develop less experienced team members. Okay. So in this case, you're working in the social context because you were implementing a new process which caused people to interact in a way that was, was more effective. Mm -hmm. This would be quite motivational for team members, both giving and receiving the training, leading to improved outcomes for both and for the company more generally. We'd call this influence method facilitate peer support. And the corresponding power was inspiring motivation. Okay, so what did you do to address the, the problem of the, the shortage of customer service skills? Well, to more directly address the poor customer service, we, est we also established a formal skills-based training program to develop customer service skills and behaviors. We helped them envision the ideal customer experience and then determined the type of training that would be necessary to get there. This included customer service behaviors as well as skills to be successful in each department and to advance their career into managerial and leadership roles. We tied the opportunity to grow into the next position with the development of the skills necessary to fulfill that position. 
It's a, generally speaking, training programs sit in the context of the self because we're focusing on the changes for each individual through their own learning and the, ideally the consequential changes in behavior. As personal development, the corresponding power is growth capability. The success of the training, however, depends on each individual's ability to engage mm -hmm. in the training and whether they're able to put that training into action afterwards. And that will all depend on the individual's confidence in engaging in the new behavior. Okay, well, the final challenge that we're talking about today related to the state of the stores. And as we mentioned earlier, for years, this organization had pulled cash out to service debt, pay bonuses, whatever, with little or no capital reinvestment. And that led to assets, the stores, that frankly looked as depreciated uh, in person as they did on the books. So we helped them restructure the way in which they thought about investing in the physical structures and created incentives and justifications for the reinvestment of profits into those capital assets. It was important, too, um, to have the board buy-in that diverting this cash for a few years would actually lead to much higher and more sustainable profits in future years. Right, and it won't take uh, anyone in the audience long to appreciate that you were working in the spaces context here. And I'm really thrilled that you were able to highlight to them the power and Im impact creating spaces can have in which customers uh, and store colleagues spend most of their time. Mm -hmm. So although this would have been very inspiring, this change was actually about overcoming barriers to reinvestment. That is the influence method that has been used here. Designed to create lasting change in the way in which they look at the physical assets. Changing a mindset from one of draining the asset to pay for bonuses to investing for capital growth. Once that mindset is established, it will be a powerful mechanism against reverting back to old ways of behaving. Okay, so having worked through each of these solutions, let's look at where the influence methods you brought into play fit in the four powers matrix. As you'll see, you have influences acting in all four mm -hmm. contexts across all four powers, which is very encouraging. In terms of grow capability, you have the customer service training and restructuring of pay and reward systems to recognize growth in skills and ability. For inspire motivation, you have the peer-to-peer -peer training baked into the job descriptions and benefits linked to the right behaviors. Finally, you have overcome barriers and resist temptations, and those are co covered by asset reinvestment program, the asset reinvestment program, and associated mind shifts that go with that. Okay. Now, of course, as we're saying, when we did this work, we ha had not met you all yet, and we hadn't deployed this four powers assessment of the organization. So, thinking back to what we did and the ecosystem, uh, the change ecosystem process, should the assessment be what we do next? Exactly right, Wes. It's, it's back to the beginning, or, or of course for you, but doing it for the yeah. first time, to <clears throat> assess the way the culture is now supporting the change that you're trying to create or not. So let's imagine that you've, we we'll just jump into the future, that you've, you've done the assessment and you've got it back and this is what it looks like on the, on the screen here. Mm -hmm. So the scores here are scored from zero to 10 with 10 indicating the highest level of changeability in that particular power and context. So if this were the outcome of the assessment, then you'd have four areas in, in which to focus and those are highlighted in red. So for instance, if you look at the top right-hand corner, mm -hmm. growth capability in the context of systems is somewhere where you should be expending some energy. Okay. Right. So in practical terms, this would mean that your attempts to change the reward system had either not yet had the des desired effect or was somehow ineffective or something additional needed to be done. In Inspire Motivation, the social context um, uh, was, in was by encouraging employees to support each other to grow and that also remained a little bit poor and needed refinement and or other changes. Similarly, the asset reinvestment mindset doesn't appear to have sunk in yet so further work might be required here. Other changes, however, appear to have been very effective. But what stands out for me is the low score in overcome barriers in the context of self mm -hmm. uh, and an, an area that you've not purposefully addressed. 
this could explain why things are getting stuck in other areas because the influence methods that work in building competence and strength in this area are reframing reasons and excuses. Maybe encourage people to see mm -hmm. things that, that are happening to them differently without changing reality and also unlearning helplessness. In this case, Danny, many colleagues will feel helpless or unable to move forward and stifled by the stagnant culture. So empl employees may need to be taught how to move out of that mindset and make it clear that they have the power and autonomy to move the organization forward. Well, I really love the, this way of looking at the, the state of the culture. And obviously, it's been a couple of years since we did this work. And so things would have had time to, to really gel. And I, I think it's time for us to go back and suggest that we do this uh, this assessment for them and find out where things where things stand. Uh, it would be interesting to see how close it is to our, our sample here. I think this has been a great way to better understand the change ecosystem, the formula for change, and the four powers change framework. And how it can be used to really bring about desirable change in organizations. And Steve, I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, you want to wrap things up for us? Sure, Wes. Today, we reviewed how we applied the human culture framework in a real client situation and explored how the four powers model was at play to help them reap confident and capable people, an inspired workplace, an agile workforce, and people armored against distractions. We all know that there are many behaviors that we should change. Hmm. We hope this real case, this real world case study demonstrated how the human culture framework in the Virtuosa team change ecosystem can be deployed to achieve change. I can see this being valuable, particularly when we encounter organizations like the one in this case study that are stuck in ways of doing things that are not productive. Okay, so with today's discussion, we're tying the bow on this webinar series. We hope you found it to be as uh, insightful as we have. We've certainly enjoyed doing it. Uh, we actually designed this to be something of a mini training session on behavior change. So we invite you to go back and watch the entire series again. And we've got a link here so you can find that and, and go do that. We would also be very happy to meet with you individually to discuss whatever your unique circumstances are. Um, how you're uh, how you're approaching things in your organization and what we might do to suggest to, to help with using this this method. Our next webinar, we're going to introduce some refinements in the human culture philosophy and framework. And uh, we believe these refinements are going to really make human culture an even more powerful framework and tool and more easily understood. So we'll let you know when the date of that webinar is. Okay, I think we've just got a couple minutes left. Um, Steve, do you have some questions uh, that we could address for people? Uh, let me take a look. Here's one. You have talked about superpowers. Are there any typical patterns in the superpowers? I should ask that. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve, I prepared a slide on that one. If you could pull it up, perhaps. Thanks. Um, so... As you can see on, on, on the slide here, um, we have got sort of a distribution that's top left to, to bottom right. The, the, the majority of superpowers occur in the grow capability space and in the self. And that's perhaps because we think about ourselves as, as more competent making change maybe than we really are. And that growing capability is a, is a more natural function for us. What's noticeable is on the bottom right-hand side, the, the block of red, where there's very typically very few people who have strengths in making changes in the systems and spaces context. And I think that's because people generally don't think about those contexts when they're in the process of making change. Yeah, what I find fascinating is that this suggests to me that the most common focus of people is to grow their own capability when organizations really need people to folk, to help others be, to be inspired, to grow capabilities, to overcome barriers and resist temptations. <clears throat> While I think it's important that people are willing to grow their own capability, it seems like an organization with too much of this type of focus can lead to, a, to dysfunction and a toxic workplace, especially if there isn't supportive social systems and spaces context for that growth. Uh, I see Scott is asking a question in the Q&A. 
Uh, and the question is, in spite of rewards and incentives, perhaps from a change management standpoint, it was resistance of employees to engage in the new desired, in the new desired behavior, fear, apprehension, denial, and so on. If so, how were these overcome? I don't know who would like to take that. Let me think about that. Um... Well, I, I think a lot of the structures that we were putting putting up there to to help each other, to, to put more incentives to help each other grow and develop and aligning the rewards with performance um, was trying to reduce some of the toxic behaviors that this organization was facing in putting down and ostracizing those people that were higher performers. And, it, and our, our hope is that as people get and develop those skills to, and behaviors to perform better. Um, and they wind up advancing over those people that simply had put their time in, um, that that will have a greater impact on uh, the culture uh, and to perform better. Does that, does that sound right to you, Wes? Yeah, I believe that's right. I think that the, the real key was moving away from that time and position uh, long-standing time and position reward system. And we didn't move all the way to a performance-based reward system, but we did get at least to a skills-based and that yeah. began to make some serious changes. Let me take one more question here. Um, what works better, carrots or sticks? I'll take this. And, and I think this is an interesting and a very prevalent question that I get a lot. And behavioral studies do suggest that sticks may be more effective because of the emotional response to the sticks. However, it's critical that we really think about the emotion that's necessary to be successful uh, and the emotional response that you're going to get to any change you make. I had a client that used sticks to garner almost 90% participation in a biometric screening program, but it, it led to such negative emotion and distrust uh, towards the organization that people did almost nothing beyond uh, what they were incented to do or penalized for not doing. Um, we helped them do a simple reframing and it, they, for the first time, achieved over 90% uh, and engagement in everything else, every other aspect of the program increased fourfold. Um, if, if you want more details on this, I, I think we covered this in in various uh, previous sessions in this webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that's about it for time. Um, thank you for joining us today. We hope you find this helpful. We would love to hear from you, learn more from you about your specific challenges or circumstances. Please remember to complete the survey you will receive following this session and let us know what else you'd like to hear from us. Uh, in future webinars. We value your feedback. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And we look forward to future time with you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.